so this is our chance to throw some of those ideas around. I'm sorry that we can't take questions from the audience. We figured it would take about 20 minutes to get a microphone to anyone. So um, I will kick off. And one thing I want to ask you, John, is immediately we got the sense when you were talking about Bit Bitcoin that you were pushing this this idea of a force for good, that you were breaking the rules in the market, the market leads. Is that because you feel Bitcoin has had a, a bad press, a bad run, that people are always talking about Bitcoin behind the dark web or the criminal activities? Are you fighting that image? Well, we're definitely fighting it, but it's more because the Bitcoin benefits are contextual. They're, they're contextual based on what part of the world you live in. In, in North America, Western Europe, we don't have the same problems that the rest of the world might, mm. might experience. Um, half of the world's population is, is unbanked. Um, they, they can't even sign up for an online university course using their credit card because they don't have a credit card. Mm. So you know, when they try to better themselves, they run into these, into these payment barriers. But because Bitcoin is contextual and the benefits are contextual based on where you live, that really uh, starts to show up in areas like Argentina, where they have 40% annual inflation. Um, they, they don't trust the, the, uh, the monetary issuer there. So Bitcoin is being adopted in places like that. And, and what does it take then to spread Bitcoin out to the places where you think it's most needed? The first thing that's needed is the exchange mechanism so that people can purchase Bitcoin. Yeah. And these can start up in informal ways or they can start up through formal exchange sites. It is, it is literally happening all over the world in every country, but to a different degree. Alex, I'm not going to paint you as the boring regulator. I know you're Thank very you. um, averse to that. But what sense do you get from governments about how they approach Bitcoin? Because they're freaked, aren't they? Well, let me say what I think anyway. I'm not sure I can't speak for all, all the governments out there. I think that uh, it's very welcome to see, you know, competition in this market like many others. And I think what John says is right, that fundamentally currencies are statements of trust. And actually governments don't have a monopoly on trust anymore. Um, it's very interesting if you look at the Edelman Trust Index, which does every year this sort of benchmarking of who's trusted. And, uh, you know, right down the bottom, unfortunately, you know, uh, financial institutions, regulators, we're pretty far down, right up the top are technology firms, um, especially consumer technology firms. So you'd want to brand yourself as a technology firm, not a financial institution, and uh, people will trust you. I think that's, uh, so I think that's, um, it's also the case that, um, you know, as an ex-technologist, I can see that something which is distributed obviously has the potential for being much more resilient and robust out there. Um, and also that um, there are a lot of bad governments out there in the world. So, I mean, it's got, to me, it's got a lot going for it. I mean, governments lose control. That's fundamental, right? And governments, right. we know, use QE to quietly devalue their own currency. Now, that doesn't work with Bitcoin anymore. So do you think this is a proper, a proper rearranging of, of the world economies, potentially? Well, it is different than national currencies because it's, it's global in nature. So, you know, it's, it, uh, one Bitcoin is just as useful to someone in China as someone in the UK. Um, and, and, and that can solve a lot of problems. It can solve a lot of problems in global remittances. Um, and it can solve a lot of problems in uh, uh, governments that are unstable, like what we saw a few years ago in Zimbabwe. Um, so, so these are things that open up new worlds of possibility once you can order society around something that is a non-political monetary unit. And that's why I tried to emphasize that this is a new ordering, because we're ordering things around what we haven't ordered it around before. You know, we've typically ordered society around government-issued monetary units. And, and I, I, I agree with Alex on the technology part. Um, and Bitcoin is a, a, a very cool technology, but it's more than a cool technology because it's also a movement. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the fact that it's a movement, um, it, 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 it transcends boundaries. Will, when you work in a disruptive technology yourself, how do you view something like a, a disruptive currency? Does it, does it thrill you, the idea of Bitcoin? Would you, do you buy into <coughs> all of the whatever coins? Yes. Um, I think whenever you're trying to predict the future, um, unless you make it sound fantastical, you're probably not going far enough. So if you had asked my grandfather to predict where we would be with computing technology, he wouldn't have got anywhere close to where we are today. Um, so uh, 
I think when you look at things like Bitcoin, you've just got to realize that maybe Bitcoin might not be a big thing in 20 years, but there will be several things in your day-to-day -day life that will be fundamentally different. Um, when Google first came about, so sorry, when the internet first came about, it was dismissed as a silly thing, um, and then it built scale. And then when Google came about, it was dismissed as like a silly thing that probably wouldn't have much scale, and then it had massive success. And Facebook, until very recently, was considered just like a silly site where people would put pictures. Um, so I would challenge um, everyone here today to, to look at these things, and I know they might sound fantastical, but um, something that currently sounds fantastical will be very banal and normal tomorrow. And that's so interesting for your world at Decoded, Catherine, because whilst everyone is, is talking about the fantastical, you probably want to root it in things that are much easier to understand, don't you? I mean, do you have to keep sort of throwing the jargon out and saying, this is just what you were doing before, but it's done like this. Absolutely, and I was having a conversation last night um, with someone about, and he was describing this incredible technology that could uh, respond to your health uh, in a t-shirt, and if you were having a heart attack, it could tell you. And we finished that statement, and he went, how terrifying, and I went, wow, at the same time. We were talking about exactly the same thing, but my perspective on it was pure excitement, possibilities, potential, and um, as opposed to fear. And in many senses, I think a lot of us are afraid because it's all changed and evolved so quickly. And I think just kind of accepting that that, that is the case, that most of us actually haven't learned this, and we're trying to catch up. And, and it is about really simplifying it and taking away the fear. And when you go into businesses, because in a sense, John, you want to come in. Do yeah, you want well, to, yeah. And the young boy that was in your presentation, I mean, that's the demographics of, of Bitcoin. There's there, boys that age and girls that age are starting Bitcoin companies. Wow. And when they start, I mean, I can't even go through the names, but there's Peer Coin and there's Gold Coin and there's all the, the, the very imaginative names now. Are they a, a threat to you in a competitive way or are they well, something they're, that you um, embrace? They're, they're derivatives of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has 97% of the overall market share for, for you know, the comparative cryptocurrencies. So they're out there, they're experimental. Um, Bitcoin learns a lot from those protocols and how they evolve, but there's something to keep an eye on, definitely. I mean, your point about Jordan, uh, the, the famous EU-speaking Jordan, is that actually there is a Jordan in all of us somewhere that, that, yes. <laughs> that needs to be unlocked, if you like, right? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you, you think about... I mean, most people won't believe that. I would say most people in the, in the audience probably don't think, ah, oh, yes, I'm going to get round to coding very shortly. <laughs> you know? I started breaking down what the skill sets of someone that made a, a very good kind of computational thinker, mm -hmm. because um, especially for the women's issue, actually, I was trying to understand where this perception came from that, and I hear this phrase a lot, that women's minds don't work that way. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand, well, what is the way that a mind that works that really gets this? And um, that was collaboration, creativity, problem solving, and particularly with um, hacking, like persistence. And um, some women could make very good hackers. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, and those, those, those are skill sets that not just women have, but that we all have. How does your, how do, how does your office mentality or, or your gender balance break down at BuzzFeed, would you say you have disproportionate number of... It's a very prescient question, actually. Um, so we, uh, two days ago, um, we actually went public with all our diversity figures. Um, uh, and we, we're 50% uh, female, I, I, so we, we, have, we are entirely representative as a business in terms of male and female. So um, when you hear Catherine talking about sure. that, I mean, what do, you, do you think you've just got the only sort of women no, so programmers? If you, if you look at the functions within the business, we are 50% female, but we're also, uh, we're only one, uh, about one sixth of our business is engineers. Um, and I would imagine if you looked at the engineers, um, because of some of the, the, the problems that Catherine's described, uh, that would be predominantly female, uh, male. Um, so, yeah. I, I would imagine the, the cryptocurrency world is pretty similar. Well, I, I think the, the image from, the, from the, the toilet queue there is probably from our last uh, Bitcoin convention. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we all have to head to then, clearly. So we, we, we would like it to change. But it starts in the universities. It starts in the, in the mathematics classes and in the hard sciences. Um, mm -hmm. And it has to start in the universities before it gets to the business world. Mm. Well, you, you were talking uh, in your five minutes about advertising and working out how not to be annoying. I mean, that's, that's got to be one of the central issues, hasn't it, for yeah. any web-based um, yeah. product. 
when you look at things like Facebook, um, they do the sponsored stories, don't mm -hmm. they? The, and you find yourself being tagged in things sort of extraordinarily, yep. or you've liked something and it never lets you forget you've liked it. Yep. Um, Google starts with the products at the top that, sure. that, that are sponsored. So if you're, if you're not running a cinema and you're yep. not showing beautiful Guinness films, yep. what's the way to, to, to advertise to us? So then? I think the reason why you see most of, the way we all see most of those problems is, um, a phenomenon known as local maximum. So you, you sort of, you see something that works as a business. So if you're an advertising business, you see the fact that if you retarget someone with an ad, um, there's a reasonable chance that they might convert to a purchase. And as a result, you throw your entire weight behind doing that and we all get hounded with ads for beard trimmers, um, in my case. Uh, and, um, and, it, and it means you're optimizing your entire business to just this, this, this first thing that you can see and what you're trying to achieve. Mm. Now, we could have built even faster scale if we'd optimized towards local maximums, if we had just done uh, sort of salacious pictures or um, very left-wing causes, because the web is quite uh, sort of um, left of center. But we ha we ha as a business, we haven't chosen to do that. We have said we want to build a long-term future and we want to do things that people enjoy. And that means that sometimes we sacrifice what could be massive growth for long-term growth. Um, but it's, it's broadly the, the obvious things. I mean, don't annoy people, don't, don't, don't irritate people online. Alex? Yeah, I think that makes, um, Will makes a really important point that the natural restraint for firms in this is actually their reputation because they've got nothing else. That's mm. what they're trading on. They depend on the trust and confidence that people have. And in that sense, one of the things that the internet, I feel, has done is it's kind of democratized regulation. So rather than being worried about being caught out by the authorities, you're actually much more worried about being caught out by your customers. Um, and if your customers feel that the way in which you're intruding on their lives is, is, is on balance resented, then you're not going to have a great future as a business. And I do think that these very, you know, the best internet companies are constantly paying attention to the enormous amount of feedback they're getting from their customer groups. They need to continue to adapt. And if they get it wrong, they're going to destroy their own market. This all goes back to decentralization. There is no top figure anymore. There is no, in your world, government figure anymore. Right. It's all peer to peer, well, whatever the, you do. Yeah. And that's something that I wanted to challenge Alex on a little bit here is because I mean, markets are, can you, why can't they be uh, spontaneous and self organizing? If you look at the, the name of uh, markets and competition authority, I mean, it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron, like, like jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Why, why do markets need an authority? Yeah, so um, uh, if, if, if markets could always take care of themselves, so um, then uh, life would be a better place. But you know, you do find you know, extremely anti-competitive behavior out there. The temptation for firms to go and quietly organize themselves, share out the market, fix prices, rig, b b b you know, uh, fix public contracts, this, this we find constantly. It is, a, it is something ingrained in the business community. And, uh, the idea that these things which do enormous harm to markets, to consumers, to other businesses should be left unchallenged is quite wrong. So, so I think what you need to recognize is that markets are very powerful, very self-correcting mostly, and very spontaneous, as you say. But in a very small number of cases, the market participants can actually ruin it for everybody, and you need authorities to deal with that. So where does that leave Bitcoin then? Because one of your memorable phrases, John, was market-based legitimacy, yeah. people power. Yeah. Now, are you happy to say that is an entire currency? It is potentially a world global force mm -hmm. that is only regulated by the market. Does that disturb you? As a competition regulator, not very much. But if I was here representing, say, the central bank, I'm sure I'd have a very different perspective. Do you ever hear from the central banks? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we do speak with, we, we do a lot of education with uh, governments and regulators around the world. Um, and, and the general consensus is that the endpoints can be regulated. So when you purchase Bitcoin you know, using your national currency, that can be regulated. But what can't be regulated is the ongoing transactions with each other, yeah. um, mm -hmm. the, the, the protocol that you, when everybody becomes their own bank and I transact peer to peer, the only yeah. way to, to really prevent that at a government regulatory level would be to turn off the internet. So just to clarify then, if I am spending Bitcoin, they would never know what I bought with that. Is there any way they can find out what I've spent my Bitcoin on? Well, definitely if you, you know, if you announce it on your, on your blog or if you're not okay, careful about Okay, let's assume I'm savvy enough just not to do that. 
Um, if I'm buying weaponry. You, Bitcoin would have user-defined privacy. So you, you would get to decide how transparent you want to be. Um, and some people may choose to be more transparent than others. But the important thing is that the choice is yours. So do you feel any responsibility then? I mean, you know, that's the other side. If you haven't got a government, if you haven't got central governments to blame, mm -hmm. then when, when arms start being traded between countries that, you know, you might feel uncomfortable with, do you, is there, is there responsibility there? Well, I'm, I'm just the executive director at a humble nonprofit, but I, I would say that uh, in answer to that, uh, um, you know, people do, money doesn't do bad things. People do bad things. And you, you shouldn't blame the, uh, the, the currency unit for what people use it for. Otherwise, the, uh, the ECB and the Federal Reserve would be in a lot more trouble. Mm. I think the, the point about the turning off the internet is really interesting because we know that's not going to happen. So the point is, this is possible at the moment. And uh, I look at a lot of businesses trying to innovate, and uh, they call it innovation. But this is a digital revolution, mm -hmm. which means um, there's going to be a lot of scary things that happen and, and destruction. But it, it is another word for innovation. I want to ask you, Catherine, because you get a real cross-section view of businesses. And Will said something um, very interesting a second ago, which is, it is, I can't remember your exact phrase, basically disproportionately left-wing. The internet is more left-wing than right-wing? Yeah, I'd say there's a left-lean. A left-leaning, yeah. OK. What, what, do you, what do you do with that, then? I mean, when you sort of come to look at businesses, and, and I mean, does that mean that most of the traffic, most of the traffic on the web, or most of the companies that use their digital sides more are, are coming from one perspective? I don't know whether that... I think there's definitely uh, uh, things that people find quite amazing is the culture of open and collaboration because it's very, very different to how big business has really grown up and to understand why would someone work for eight years on a line of code that anyone could use mm. um, to create a multi-million pound business. And that's just a very interesting debate in its own right. Yeah. <laughs> what I'd say get, about the internet yeah. is um, the internet has actually been a fantastic opportunity for minority voices to be heard. So mm -hmm. yeah. the reason why at BuzzFeed we've gone public with our um, sort of demographics of our, our staff is that we know in order for us to, to live up to the dream of being this media company for the future, we need to maximize the opportunity of the web. And that means representing multiple voices that probably aren't so well represented in existing top-down, patriarchal, one-voice media companies. We don't want to be a one-voice media company. We want to be a sort of multitude of voices. And do you worry um, that that disappears with size? Do you think that you can grow and retain that sense of minority voice? So it's a, it's a constant... Um, point of conversation at BuzzFeed that, that we have always seen us, that we have identified ourselves as being a challenger to the large established legacy media companies. Um, when we announced our most recent round of financing, we actually simultaneously announced that we were breaking this one organization down to four organizations in order to maintain that sense of independence. Um, and one thing that's very refreshing about not just BuzzFeed, but other companies like BuzzFeed, I would imagine Decoded is the same, is that um, we don't have that sense of central control and, and authority. I have seen 22-year-old coders are arguing vociferously with um, venture capitalists who own 10% of the company, and the VC guy or girl eventually says, you know what, um, Tom, you're right. Like, that, that's the way that we've, we've managed Amazing. to have a competitive edge. Um, Alex, I'm going to give you the last word because we're running out of time, but it must be interesting for you when you're looking at these if you like, the feisty small competition that yeah. suddenly gets big. I yeah. mean, do you think of Amazon and Google now as being establishment companies, or do you think of them still being the, the rule breakers? Yeah, I think that's a real question. I mean, if you look at, uh, there was a real nice article in the Wall Street Journal about this by Peter Thiel, you know, the, the mm. co-founder of PayPal uh, just last month, and he was saying you could look at, at Google, you could say, look, they're really strong dominant in search. But if you look at their share of advertising market around the world, it's about 3% or consumer tech. You know, they're very small in that. So, so it's a question of kind of perception and also how the firms behave. You know, you asked, you know, were they also, are, they, are they still a kind of like a challenger, an exciting challenger like that? Well, after a lot of the developments in Europe over the last two years, you know, all the American tech companies have really, have really increased their lobbying effort there, you know, which is more like a traditional kind of corporate response. So I think that's, uh, you know, um, at the... Uh, 
And it's not surprising that they do that because, you know, really that they have this huge cases against them at the moment. Yeah. But I think, on, you know, um, right at the outset, you, you asked, you know, whether we should be, you know, welcoming on balance the internet or whether we should be fearing it. And I think it sounds to me, everyone on this panel, we're all in the welcome mode, you know, on balance. On that note, uh, we shall thank you all very much and uh, end there. John Matone as well, Hayward, Alex Chisholm and Catherine Parsons. Thank, thank you all you. very much and thank you for listening.